It's Drew Klein with the WFEA Morning Update on 99.9 and AM 1370 WFEA. Hey, we have on the line now Kelly Ayotte, candidate for governor. Hey, Senator Ayotte, how are you? Uh, Great, Drew. How are you today? Hey, I'm pretty good, but I didn't get to go on a ride along with the Manchester police. (laughs) uh, So I'm not doing that good, you know. No, it was I got to go to roll call and then I was out with the Manchester Police Department yesterday. And I was quite an experience, as you know. First of all, they have an excellent department, uh, Mm. very dedicated officers. And uh, the young officer that I was out with, uh, he uh, is a a great, great person. He's from Plymouth, New Hampshire, and then uh, started out at that police department and then went to Manchester. And uh, so I learned a lot. It was They got called to an incident um, while I was with the officer, that was uh, involved a firearm uh, where a woman was threatened and uh, two other guys that were, that they had to in an apartment building. So it was a real danger situation trying to secure. Wait, you were, sure they... you were there on that call. Well, I, I couldn't go in with that. Yeah, yeah, right. were... You were in the car. So I was, yeah, I it was in the car. I heard it all. And then I was outside and the SWAT team came. And so, um, you know, these are, these That's are pretty things exciting. that the, it was exciting, and these are things the Manchester Police Department, you know, deals on a fairly regular basis. So uh, their their shifts are busy, and yeah. they have a lot going on. And we had other things that were, you know, like a car accident, things like that too. Yeah. But um, you know, and they're still dealing with a big drug issue. But I have a lot of respect to the police, and I also got an earful. I want you to know, Drew, on our bail law. So oh, really? Yeah. They want the legislature to fix this. And oh, yeah. The officer that I was driving along with, he actually was uh, injured from a guy who shouldn't have been out on bail. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they, he basically bit his finger and he uh. had to have serious like like it was a serious incident where he had to be out of work for six months. That's how serious it was. Right. Well, this is how it works. Right. So we pass these laws that sort of well, let's be lenient and let people out and then. Because you're not on the front lines dealing with it. The cop is. Right. And then he gets to deal with the same people over and over and over Correct. again. Correct. It's and, the same. That's their frustration, yeah. you know, that there's there's certain players that should not be out yeah. uh, that are just in this revolving door where literally he's saying to me, I'm, I'm finishing the paperwork. I'm not even done my paperwork on these people. And they're back out on the street. Yeah, yeah. And so for an officer, they, they want to do their job. They want to keep the city safe. They want to keep the state safe. So. That makes their job more frustrating. So I do hope the legislature addresses this issue. If not, I'm going to be pushing hard on this as governor. And uh, you have a back the blue plan that you've put out? I do. I do have a back the blue plan. And, you know, from my experience as attorney general, but also I've been visiting departments throughout the state, uh, sitting down with uh, different departments, also state police. We're down 70 troopers right now, Drew. Mm -hmm. Um, And the other thing that's scary as well as we're down almost 50 percent on corrections officers can yeah. you imagine that yeah no that's so, a serious i'm glad you mentioned the correction officers uh kelly at because that is a is a super serious issue um for safety of other prisoners for safety of the correct. correction officers who were there um right and part of it we've heard is a pay issue part of it is working like how do you see that what can the governor do what can the state do to say like we need to get yeah. more officers so what what we need to do, we're, we're also working against, right now we just have a retention and recruitment issue. You know, Manchester's down over 20 officers too. Mm-hmm. So here's the issue. Na- we've got the national dialogue that was negative on police, right, yes. with the defund the police movement. And, you know, that's not who we are here in New Hampshire. So it's making sure our first responders know how much we appreciate their work. And, you know, they have tough jobs. They've got to go out nights, weekends, holidays. Mm-hmm. And so... That's number one. Number two, the changes that were made to the retirement system in 2011 have made us uncompetitive now. So we need to make some um, adjustments to the, to the retirement system because mm-hmm. that is a co- it's literally I'm talking to all of the police about this. It's causing us officers to leave and to not stay and to go to other places. So huh. we're going to have to do that if we want to have a good, uh, solid police force in this state. And so I'm going to be I know the legislature, the House has actually taken up some bills on that and mm-hmm. passed them. And and uh, the Senate hasn't seemed to do anything yet on it. But we're going to have I, I think because corrections is under that, too, Drew. Yeah. So yeah. that has an impact on that. And then you can imagine as a corrections officer, you sort of got the national drop uh, backdrop on the law enforcement. We need to make sure that the culture at the corrections 
you know, that, that there are corrections officers, um, you know, know that we respect what they do. We mm. respect the importance of what they do. So I'm going to be looking at all of that um, right. because we just can't, we're blessed to be ranked the, the safest state in the nation. But if we don't have the people that go out every day and, and really make this happen for us, like this can erode pretty quickly. Right. And I think your point about just the appreciation, showing the appreciation, you know, letting people yeah. know this is a respected job in our community. Um, right. That, that can and go and honestly, I think I think just Drew, I'd love to elevate service in general. Right. I mean, the pu- first responders are serving all of us. And, you know, I also of course, I come from a military family. So I think, you know, serving in some capacity. Now, some people choose to be a first responder or they choose to be in the military. But there's other ways we all can serve sure. to be part of something bigger than ourselves, because that makes our state better. It makes our country better. Uh, so, Kelly Ayotte, Cindy Warmington, who hopes to be the Democratic nominee, um, is talking about you a lot. Yeah. And she's challenging you to a debate. She's ignoring, uh, you know, that you haven't won a primary yet. You know, it's still a, it's right. a real thing. Right? <laughs> uh, and, you know, so my first reaction is, wow, that's sexist. You're single out and attacking the woman. But uh, that's how some people would frame that, you know, not me. <laughs> But, you know, what do you, what do you make of uh, Cindy Warmington just going after you nonstop? Um, yeah, also... first of all, let, let's let's make no mistake. Cindy Warmington has to prove that she can actually win her own primary. Yeah. And I think that, you know, she's trying to, to get some oxygen in her own primary mm-hmm. and get people to pay attention. And she's using my name to do it. So I get it. Uh, you know, she has a lot of her own problems, which I, if she's their nominee, I'm happy to talk about, Drew, especially... <laughs> The work she did for Purdue Pharma uh, as a lobbyist asking for lesser regulations on OxyContin, and we know how many people in our state have died as a result of the, the outflow of uh, the opioid epidemic. So, you know, let, let's see let's see what she can do in her own primary first. And, you know, my debates will be, of course, in my own primary before I'm, uh, I'm getting against mm-hmm. her, but I'm happy to take her on if she's their nominee. Uh, yeah, so she wants to debate you ne- like now, like before the primaries are over. Um, hey, have you ha- has anybody from her team like actually reached out to you, uh, your team, or is this all just like radio talk? This is all like political talk where they reach <laughs> like they reach out to like you know radio or someone yeah. who we'd like to debate Kelly. At. It's it's just it's all sort of ridiculous political radio talk that. Um, you know, listen, I guess uh, I guess she, be, she should be flattered. I should be flattered that she wants to, you know, debate me and, mm. and talk to talk about me. I think um, I'm happy to get in the debate with her if she can beat Joyce Craig. <laughs> and I'm also happy to do it to beat to debate Joyce Craig if she's their nominee, because we know what happened in Manchester under mm. her leadership. So and and let them explain that. And by the way, as you know, they have such a different vision for our state. Mm. I mean, you know, Joyce Craig endorsed by Maura Healey, turning the state into Massachusetts. I mean, they're for higher taxes, more government, less freedom. And so that's a debate I'd love to have any day of the week. So, uh, Kelly, for the second month in a row, um, in the Swanton sector, the U.S. border uh, has hit a record number of um, encounters with illegal migrants coming across the border. Um, what's your Kind of just your your gut reaction to that, and what, as Governor of New Hampshire, do you think um, you could do or you would like to see done uh, to to deal with this? Yeah, my gut reaction is, Drew. Um, unfortunately, I'm not surprised. I've I've been up uh, to Pittsburgh and certainly spoken to the locals and the law enforcement up there. The co in, in fact, all the Coas County the commissioners have endorsed me, and the Republican reps in Coas County talked to local law enforcement. We knew this issue was there, um, having visited the border. So, But now we're just seeing the numbers back up. What Governor Sununu has been saying, uh, what I've been saying in this race, is that what's happening on our southern border, of course, it's the same policies, the disastrous policies of the Biden administration, the same thing's happening on our northern border, which is, to me, uh, continuing to support our law enforcement up there. I support the efforts the legislature has put in place and the governor for more resources on for our law enforcement and patrolling and enforcing, uh, you know, our laws. Second, they have a communication problem up there, Drew. Uh, when I've talked to the law enforcement and the commissioners up there, right now their radio systems can't talk to federal radio systems. Mm. And, you know, 
that's an officer safety issue, but it's also when you're out in larger, you know, larger areas of land, as you know, in our North country, uh, they have, if they see illegal immigrants, they have to be able to communicate directly with ICE. So we can fix that. And uh, I know they already have some applications in for some federal dollars on that, but I, I think we should fix that. It would help us on the immigration front. And then finally, like, let's not make sure New Hampshire never becomes a sanctuary, right? We can look over in Massachusetts and see what's happening. And no, no illegal, you know, license, no licenses for illegal immigrants, no benefits, uh, you know, certainly no housing and no sanctuary cities in our in our uh, no sanctuary town cities. I wish the legislature would pass that law. Mm-hmm. Right. So Sandy Warmington has said, uh, hey, you know, it's, we won't have a state ban on it, but municipalities <laughs> can do what they want. Yeah, well, that's that's such a cop out and such a joke, because basically what she's saying there is, um, yes, I support sanctuaries. In other words, I'm going to let Lebanon decide that they, uh, you know, are going to be a sanctuary place, or I'm going to let Portsmouth decide that. And so essentially that makes New Hampshire a place where illegal immigrants can come and there won't be cooperation between the federal and locals that should be to enforce not only our local in our state laws, but also our immigration laws. So I, I just think that's a cute way for her to to try to avoid actually telling the people of New Hampshire that she supports sanctuary policies. So I want to ask you one thing that's this trend that's starting at colleges around the country, and it's not the protests. It is um, MIT. Their president has said, you know what? We're doing away with DEI statements, diversity statements. They're against the First Amendment. We're getting rid of them. They don't even work. Um, Big. That Mm -hmm. was a big deal. Uh, University of Florida system uh, has... uh, abolished all of its DEI offices and fired its DEI officers. North Carolina is doing a similar thing, uh, getting, they actually took half their DEI budget at the university system and is donating it to the campus police. Um, Do you have thoughts on, like, you looking towards UNH, um, they have diversity officers, they have a, you know, diversity mission statement, um, just kind of as you conceive of what the right role is for DEI and DEI statements and, and officers and that kind of thing at a university system. Have you, you know, had a chance to sort of think about that as an issue? Well, here's what I think, uh, Drew, is first first of all, I think New Hampshire stands for this. We, we want uh, equal opportunity for everyone to attend our state universities uh, and people, especially our kids in here in New Hampshire, uh, of all backgrounds and, and from out of state, if they want to pay our out of state tuition of all backgrounds mm-hmm. and, and if they're qualified and they meet the standards for admission at, at UNH. And from my perspective, I would rather see those resources uh, that are being spent on DEI to make the whole institution more affordable for everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that to me is a better use of resources uh, rather than, you know, focusing extra bureaucracy on certain areas. But let's make sure just hey, this is a place that is um, equal opportunity for everyone, but but I don't think we need an office to do that. Uh, I think that, you know, and our admission standards are, are uh, you, you meet them and we, we want you to come and we want you to be part of the university. And, and let's, let's also, instead of spending more money on more bureaucracy, make it more affordable. All right, so um, we're going to have to take off here, but Kelly, uh, um, debates in your primary. Anything coming up? You guys sure. talking about it? Uh, yeah, we're talking about it. Yep. So we're definitely will do them and okay. uh, looking forward to it. And so as I'm sure as we get uh, closer to the primary on September 10th, uh, I look forward to debating Chuck Morris and, and anyone else who decides to get in this race. <laughs> so it'll, uh, you know, we we are filing periods in June and yeah. uh, there certainly are some that's right. Some issues that, that we can debate each other on and uh, may the best woman win. <laughs> So, uh, all right, last question. What's your favorite Dunkin' Donut? My favorite what? Dunkin' Donut flavor. Dunkin' Donut. Oh, I, I like the maple frosted. I have one right here. I'm looking at a no maple way. frosted. Yes. Uh, it's a good Yum. choice. Yum. All right. Uh, Kelly, right. Uh, thanks a lot for your time this morning. Thanks, Drew. Take all care. Right. Bye. See ya. We'll be right back on 99.9 and AM 1370 WFEA.